notes of uncontaminated sound. Once again, there was a little jingle created for the show by LA-based Walter ETC, or as some may formally know as Walter Mitty in his makeshift orchestra. True bohemians are rare these days, but the Berlin-based duo Danielle D. Picciato and Alexander Hackey are exactly that, bohemian artists of lore living a true nomadic life in which we younger artists can only dream of. The late 80s Berlin was a heady time. Political tensions were still high and the, the wall had yet to fall. It was 1987 when Danielle decided to pick up from New York and move to Berlin. This was the backdrop in which Alexander and Danielle met within the confines of the small artisan community that included Nick Cave in the Bad Seeds. It was in such a time in which living in warehouses, parties, fluid love affairs, and experimental art consumed all. A backdrop which set the stage for an eventual marriage in 2006 in a prolific 20 plus year musical and artistic career that continues to this day. This is Hackett Di Picciato. So please enjoy number 56, one of my more fluid conversations to date, Rob Lumberg, artist and photographer. Thank you. And now ah. we're recording. So uh, Danielle and uh, I, I'm sorry, Alexander, is that correct? Yeah. Correct. Oh, pleasure to meet you. Um, and like I said, over my little spiel prior to hitting record on Zoom, um, just having a co casual conversation on um, craft and what you've been up to during these heady times of either lockdown or just like isolation and now all sorts of variants going down. So I'm just really curious of uh, what you've been up to, you know, during these times and how, how you've continued to you know, pursue your craft and, and develop your craft in even in times of deep isolation, I guess. So um, I guess, so let's start on that note. Uh, I know you have, is the new album Silver Thresholds out now or is that you releasing that coming up soon or? Oh, it's it's been out for a while. It's been out since the 12th of November. Oh, wow, wow. Um, well, can you speak a bit about that, uh, about the album? Uh, I'll start off with that, I guess, because uh, I guess, is that uh, a, uh, a recent uh, product of uh, kind of lockdown stuff? Or a, a, did you already plan this album out prior to pandemic and all that? Well, I mean, um, to answer your first question, we're um, experimental freelance artists. Hmm. and as an experimental freelance artist you don't really have a choice but to continue doing what you're doing no matter what happens and it's um a never-ending road of ups and downs so a pandemic is only one of many things we've experienced mm -hmm. um so we kind of treated it like that mm -hmm. and the album we um we had planned to do another album um we kind of do a new album almost every second year sometimes every year. Hmm. And um, we had started working on it, kind of thinking about it before the pandemic, but then we really started working on it during the pandemic uh, on last um, October, 2020, um, because that's when we had basically booked the studios and we had applied for a grant and we got the grant. So it kind of was like, you know, the way we kind of always do things. We plan to do it in a certain amount of time. And because we live off of our art, we do not have day jobs. We have to keep a very tight time schedule. Mm. And so um, pandemic or not, we had to do the record. <laughs> yeah, and as, as opposed to uh, our former releases, um, which were recorded in places like the Mojave Desert or in a medieval church in Austria or uh, in the decrepit uh, amusement park town of Blackpool on the northwest coast of England. Um, this actually happened here in Berlin, like uh, and in Brandenburg. And we, you know, we didn't get out much and uh, we we looked a little bit at the area and we kind of uh, 
took inspiration from the landscape and the place where we really are at. And also what was also very inspiring was um, the, that first lockdown summer, not this summer, but the previous summer in, in 2020, um, we would take our bicycles into downtown Berlin, mm. which was just like completely empty. All the, all the tourists were gone and, and it was very, very desolate. And uh, it was a little bit like the 80s, to tell you the truth, but uh, also it was a little bit like um, some dystopian um, movie production where we were the last people left on the planet and stuff like that. And, and that did really uh, influence our writing, I think. Mm -hmm. Now to kind of go all the way back to kind of some biographical stuff, um, Danielle, is, is it correct you were born in Seattle? And then how, is that correct? In Tacoma. Oh, Tacoma? I was born in Tacoma, yeah. Yes. And so yeah. How, can you like, not to go into the whole timeline, but how did you kind of evolve into, uh, you know, experimental artist living in Berlin and, um, you know, creating a, a breath of work that it, it, it's so deep. So how, how did you get, I guess, from, from my ramblings, part of me, how did you start uh, get from Tacoma to Berlin, I guess? Like, <laughs> in a well, short... my, my father was in the army. Hmm. He was an oral surgeon in the army. And so I was an army brat. And I was in Tacoma only for like, I think three months. Oh, okay. We moved on to Colorado, to Denver, and then to Michigan. Um, I think Chicago and um, DC, New York. So we moved around a lot. In between, oh, wow. we were in Germany. My father was stationed in Solingen and um, in Neubrücken. So basically by the time I was 12, I had, I think moved 13 times. Wow. Um, so I was kind of born into that nomadic lifestyle from the start. Yeah. And um, my mother is German. And so um, when my parents split, my mother moved back to Germany. So I would always be going back and forth from the States to Germany. And um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, being in Germany at all is always has always been like, well, you have to go to Berlin because Berlin's always been like something special. And um, the first time I did, I was like, wow, this is like heaven. The first time I was there was I think 84. And then I came and I moved to Berlin in 87. And um, the first time the first time I came, I was like, this is heaven. This is when David Bowie was in Berlin. And, you know, it was like that legendary kind of dark, kind of really dark place. But um, it was so creative. And it was it was just like being in a movie all the time. So mm -hmm. I, when I had the chance, I moved there in 87. I had a friend who was living there and she said, come and visit me. And so I went to visit her and she had a room free. She was living in like a, you know, with a couple of people in this huge loft. She said, there's a room free. So I just moved in. I didn't even get any furniture. I was like, I'm staying. <laughs> West Berlin, this is West Berlin she's talking about, right? That, that yeah. little island within East Germany. Before the wall came down. Oh yes, yes. And at the time, were you, you committed to your like arts or to become an artist or are you just uh, living this more of a bohemian lifestyle and, and then kind of like, picked you really uh concentrated on when do i guess when do you start uh when did you say like i, I want to create like or you know i've always been creating yeah i mean always i started playing violin when i was 10 piano when i was six mm. um i was always drawing i studied um at um in new york at parsons um illustration and i had music instrument music lessons and so from the very start, it was, it was clear that I was, I was always doing it anyway. It was kind of like, you know, why I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing. So I'm just going to try and earn money with it. Yeah. Not that I earned a lot of money, but, you know, when I moved to Berlin, um, I was doing all of that, but I was working in cafes and stuff like that, you know, because back then Berlin was so cheap. You only had to work in a cafe like two, three times a week and you could pay the rent and everything. Wow. It was just super cheap. When the, the, part, the place I moved, the room I moved into was 500 um, square feet. It was huge. 500 square meters. Square meters, <laughs> like really huge. That's, that's a couple thousand square feet. Yeah, it was like huge. And I had to pay 30, 30 marks a month, which is $15. 
And coming from New York back then, I was yeah. I'm staying. <laughs> wow. That, that, wow. Yeah. I can't it's imagine doing that in the city now in New York. It, it's crazy for a studio. It's like, yeah, the studio's going for three grand at least, you know, and it's like, yeah. how can you afford that? You know, and that's why I'm a bit upstate right now. And uh, I'm like, myself, I, I kind of, I'm like, I, I want to move to Berlin myself. I'm like, <laughs> Well, it's more expensive now. Oh, I know, I know. Yeah, those days are definitely over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. back then, I, I, even back then, you know, the studios in, in New York would be a thousand bucks. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, coming to like this huge place um, for fifteen was just kind of I just couldn't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I'm staying. I'm not even gonna get my furniture. Who cares? <laughs> I got a bed. It's fine. <laughs> And when did you two meet? Uh, uh, I guess uh, that's a kind of follow-up question to the fire. Uh, sorry, I'm all over the place. But uh, when did you guys meet and, and really find that energy to to create a, a not even just like a romantic partnership, but also creative partnership and, and work together and so many, I, yeah, yeah, on projects and stuff. Um, I noticed the first time I saw Danielle. I remember was must have been her first year here. It must have been like 87, 88. She was standing at the bus stop sporting an all black pleather outfit. Um, I made myself. <laughs> and a and a she was wearing a beehive. So she was like uh, very tall with the, you know, it was like extra head on top of her head. And uh, I was fascinated by that creature from the first time I saw her. And um, as Berlin, West Berlin was this, mm, you know, it was this village, this island, you know, in, uh, in the middle, uh, surrounded by the, the Iron Curtain. So the, the scene was, was fairly small and fairly intimate and fairly incestuous too. So we all knew each other's boyfriends and girlfriends in you know various degrees of knowing them and um so uh yeah uh, and uh so we've been hanging out since 87 since 87 in that, in that factory that i was living at there was the keyboarder of nick cave mm. roland wolf back then and he was best friends with alex so that's how I kind of met the music scene really fat early on because the Bad Seeds were there and Neubauten were there and yeah. like almost all of the you know musicians back then. Besides that, there was a hairdresser living there too, and she would cut everybody's hair for free, so everybody came. So it was like this place where people would just go, and we basically it was met. all in all, it was only like a few hundred people, you know, yeah. in, in West Berlin. The the scene was was very very secluded and very small. And so we, we met and uh, in 2001, we, it turned out that we were both unattached. For the first time, single, <laughs> 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 we had the chance. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we started doing projects pretty much immediately when we got together because that's also, I suppose, a thing that's uh, ingrained into the Berlin uh, mentality is that here there was never any um, there was never any ghetto for this is a filmmaker or this is a musician this is a writer or this is an artist everyone would do everything and mm. so we pretty much immediately started working together on one thing or another and uh, in fact, what we started working on were like audio visual projects where we had the idea to do things where the visual part is as important as the audible part, yeah. uh, as opposed to the way it usually goes. Somebody does a video to a piece of music or uh, somebody writes um, some score for a film. And we, we um, started setting up these projects where both elements were supposed to be equal and the mixture of them was supposed to create a third entity. We kind of created like our own world because yeah. um, we, we didn't want to wait for somebody to invite us to do something. I mean, the first thing we did together was actually a commission by a theater and they asked me, because I was doing a lot of super eight loops back then and doing installation in clubs and outside and stuff. 
And they said, would you do an installation loop in the theater and um, have live music played to it? So I asked Alex to do the music and I did the, basically I showed my live Super 8 visuals and um, that was fun. He was really drunk, but that was still fun. <laughs> Yeah, I was, still, was, I was still, super drunk. I was still a wild and crazy guy. <laughs> I was kind of worried that he would just like, you know, I don't know, collapse or something in between, but it was fun. Hmm. And so that kind of set the tone for what we were going to be doing in the, in the future. At that time, what were you trying to express with your visual, oh, your, your multi, uh, I guess, lack of brain power right now, oh, multiverse or uh, just the multimedia uh, projects, I guess. Uh, what what were you trying to uh, communicate or express at that time? Um, and what was like well, sparking I mean, that flame of inspiration, I guess? Well, the thing I thought was really interesting about the Super 8 loops was that I would film women dancing, hmm. um, all kinds of different women. I just say, you know, just I'll put on some music, I'm going to film you. Hmm. And they could wear whatever they wanted. They could dance whatever they liked. And I would make loops out of them. And I would project them on like this gauze and clubs. And if you would loop them, they would actually dance to any music. Interesting. Because the eye is faster than the ear. So they would dance in clubs to hip hop, to techno, to whatever. And people would just stand in front of them mesmerized. Like, how, how are you doing that? Why are they able to keep in rhythm with every single piece you know right. so that was something I was really interested in and like how to manipulate um, what people see in a way with really simple methods because it was only super eight and gauze basically yeah well, one of our, one of our early aims or like the concepts that we talked about was uh, um, to create friction between different kind of genres between different uh, kinds of art forms and uh, overcome um, this ghettoization of, as, as I said before, um, because you know if you create if you create friction, you know right. friction um, creates energy, heat, you know, and, and we thought like if if we combine very very different things with each other, then then uh, something interesting would happen. And also one thing that that we did very early on is we got uh, asked by these. Um, local promoters here that owned a bunch of clubs, um, they, they had just purchased um, one of the first discotheques in Germany mm. called the Big Eden. Um, that was- It's um, like lion skins, that was, zebra skins everywhere. It was, it was like founded by- well, 70s. It was founded by this, this <laughs> famous playboy kind of Hugh Hefner kind of guy. Yeah. And uh, at the Kurfürstendamm in the downtown West uh, Berlin city and- uh, so they, they had that place and they didn't really know what to do with it. And so we started doing a, a series of uh, events of parties there, which we called uh, Bada Bing, like the strip joint in the <laughs> Sopranos. Yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> and, and there we would, we would set up these nights. Uh, Danielle would do all these like elaborate uh, installations within that 70s disco uh, discotheque, which was great. And then we would invite very different, very contrary uh, uh, musical acts, like um, a Turkish belly dance troupe, a, um, a Slayer cover band, and a, um, you know, like electro, uh, electro clash uh, techno act or mm. something like that. So we would get like <clears throat> these very different scenes. Always of, three. Yeah, always three, always very different scenes of audience also gathering in that weird 70s place. And, and that kind of spurred a, a lot of what we did in, in uh, uh, executive uh, in, in the years to, to come. And um, yeah, until we... Yeah, because we noticed that if you put together things that actually are opposing, it, it like creates something new. And we thought this we could do also with our own work. Right. Like we don't only have to do it by putting bands together and creating like this crazy atmosphere. I mean, those nights were just insane. Everybody was like out of their heads and okay. it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And uh, so we said, that's actually a really interesting thing to do is to put together something that you usually don't put together because then the thing that 
develops is really different. And so we started doing that with our own projects. Yeah, like ce celebrating the, the differences between our characters and mentality it's and uh and histories too and yeah. and histories and because um, alex is a real berliner which is just as rare as basically a real new yorker <laughs> yeah that's true <laughs> <laughs> everybody's a transplant oh well, now right. it's, especially now everybody's moving around you know all over the place but uh interesting oh actually i'm i'm i've been on that same tr type of mindset as well like i based off the series prior to the pandemic, I was holding shows surrounded by my imagery and all the different bands I've shot. And I just love that eclectic elements, you know, diverse elements getting together. And uh, you bring all a diverse group a crowd together as well. But I'm fascinated well, visually too now, I, I particularly been on visual studies as well, just putting, you know, taking, I have a degree in criminal justice. So I have a a forensic approach to <laughs> um, pho photography and I'm working on a, a series now of more of a forensic kind of trace evidence kind of approach to documenting found objects you know this is just me just wandering around in the streets because I'm just like I feel so isolated right now since uh, pandemic times but um, and oh, well, I, which actually this spun off of a workshop I took from Node Center, the Curatorial Center in Berlin. Uh, Node, it's online strictly, but last year it's called NODE uh, in, in a, a, a hyphen, uh, abbreviation. And it's like a five week workshop uh, on um, online, but they're based, I guess, in Berlin or maybe just strictly online. I, I don't know if it's a physical institute or not. It just sparked my imagination just to get my my mind going but uh i don't know what's going with that sorry uh, <laughs> i had no I, I i generally like to go on tangents or just have conversations so i i, I do find you know uh particularly these days in a, like a really uber corporate environment a late capitalist uh, society that we live in and oversaturation in you know digital content the word content you know and etc I find it really important to harken back to the experimental, uh, uh, I guess, movements, you know, back in the 60s, uh, 50s, that, you know, back, go back to our early movements, try to bring in those techniques and clash with, you know, and, and um, try to kind of, I, I, and try to just make something that's not overproduced, you know, uh, these days in, over overproduced highly you know uh, defined imagery or you know um, so I'm always fascinated with the experimental approach and, and um, methodologies that people continue to use uh, and that and I guess that yeah that I didn't have a point once again sorry <laughs> I didn't have a follow-up question to that but um, I guess Al Alex did you um have a, a just a bit more biographical of do you have a did you have a formal art artistic training or, or did you just dive into it yourself yeah. no 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 <laughs> no when I, uh, I i just uh i just figured that i'm good at it and when i turned 15 i cleared out my locker in, uh, in school and decided i'm a professional musician now and uh, luckily it has worked out okay since mm. And, I'm, and I was, you know, I haven't punched a clock in my life, and I'm very proud of that. I've never, um, you know, collected any uh, social, uh, you know, security or whatever. And uh, no, I don't have a formal training, but uh, I, I've always read a lot, and I've always educated myself uh, in with any available media all the time, and like what you were just mentioning uh, reminds me of like the cut-up technique the borrows brian geisen cut-up technique and and all these kind of things certainly um influence uh, the things that that we we do uh but then we also have um, additionally we have uh more like a uh, 
I don't, I don't want to use that word, but it is it is a little bit like an like an almost like an esoteric approach because we we believe that uh, it all boils down to vibrations and to resonance and what we do as Hake de Picciotto is based on the interaction yeah. between Danielle and myself and we create a certain intensity that people are able to resonate with and so what we do uh, is of course it's experimental and and it, it we apply different techniques and and different strategies but then on the other hand it really is energy work yeah. in a way that it is about vibrations and it is about that resonance between ourselves and and with the audience and to to uh ritualistic also if you will uh, in order to uh, achieve a certain state of mind yeah. for everyone in the room yeah i don't know if you know but in 2010 we um decided that we were going to give up everything we had here and become nomads oh wow and yeah we had a house here we gave it up we put everything in storage and we decided because berlin was starting to become gentrified and we were like this doesn't make sense. We are only working to pay our rent and we just don't, that's not why we want to do what we're doing. Sure. Um, and so we thought it was only in Berlin. So we thought we're going to just travel the world and we're going to find something better. And so we decided to travel the world for 18 months, but basically we're still nomads. It's just that we're stuck in Berlin at the moment because of the pandemic. But um, so we started traveling and we realized quite quickly that gentrification was everywhere, obviously. And um, we're just really stubborn and stuff like that. We're like, we're not going to succumb. We're going to find a place where we can actually do what we want to do with people that think the same way. And um, but being a nomad is really not very. It's pretty tough. Yeah. So um, we had to kind of change our life. Before we start became nomads, we were like, you know, nightlife, drinking, all everything, like just the typical kind of underground experimental artist life and then when we started becoming no when we became nomads we realized we can't live that way anymore because if you don't have a home and if you're traveling and you're constantly tired it's jet lag you kind of have to change change that because otherwise we wouldn't have managed so we stopped drinking we um stopped smoking we became vegan all that kind of stuff because we just had to do it health wise because we were like going back and forth. Like we went through the States, through Europe, through Australia, through New Zealand. It was like nonstop jet lag, nonstop, like a different city every day. And it was so exhausting that we just realized, okay, we have to be like super clear and super disciplined to be able to go through with this. And that kind of changed everything. I mean, that's kind of like, I think before we became nomads, our theme was kind of like mainly the nightlife, like the rebellious nightlife, you know, yeah. like we don't, follow or adhere to regular rules we're you know we're the nightlife and so then when we became nomads it was okay we're nomads now that's different and that kind of brought us to the energy of the work that Alex is speaking about because um we were like okay well if we've given up all boundaries then our music should also just turn into something that fits to that and it kind of became the soundscape of our travels mm. and um and a big part of our travels was keeping our energy strong and, you know, like just surviving in a way. And then, but at the same time, um, having like an eagle's view of the world, of seeing what's actually happening everywhere, yeah. you know. Yeah, um, but you, you, you know, if you change your life in that way, you, uh, in the best case scenario, you, you get uh, good insights about things and, uh, when we had liberated ourselves from these architectural structures, we uh, found that we, for one thing, we could also liberate ourselves from unnecessary, uh, obsolete musical structures. Mm -hmm. And so music became a lot freer and, and um, it transformed in that way. And also in our lifestyles, we, uh, we figured since we had liberated ourselves from this grind of having to go on tour in order to pay the rent and stuff like that, why not also liberate ourselves from this 
grind or this cycle of um, of punishment and reward, if you will, you know, like going, uh, okay, I'm going to work on this deadline really, really hard. Um, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to go through with it. And then I'm going to get hammered and uh, go, go. And then I party and then I get really wild. And then, oh, and uh, the next day I will feel really bad. And that'll be the due punishment for the reward I have given, had mm. given myself. And then, you know, like, uh, but then I, I'll just do this other commission and I work till the deadline. And then I can really let go and reward myself with and and this is just really stupid and also it doesn't work out <laughs> no, no. we, we figured these things you know yeah so that's basically that's how our music became the music that it's now hmm. and so um that's the bit that's the backstory of our music now actually i i've kind of gone through a similar process myself in the last few years when i kind of left full-time work and uh, decided to become an artist and, and moved to New York from Boston, you know, from a cushy, you know, security realm and corporate realm. I was in UX and tech and prior to that security and steady jobs. And, you know, I come from a family with steady work and, and union workers that, you know, stay in one position for 30 plus years. And I'm coming to New York. I, I've had all those insights, you know, of humanity and it, it expanded how I view the world too, and through struggle, through having working with you know people, you know, in restaurants, you know, and you know, from and, and I and I try to go back to old friends and I can't connect with them because they're in this that templated corporate or just templated late capitalist uh, lifestyle of house, kids, job, etc. And I can't go back to that, you know. So I, I find myself in that kind of strange surreal kind of hind, uh, uh, realm of like, oh, I've totally changed. It's not, they didn't change, I've changed because I've seen so much of humanity through my, not even like your experience, I, I haven't even traveled like that, but it's just through my experiences in New York alone, I, I, I've seen a lot, you know, where I haven't been able to connect with even my family because they've just kind of, stayed the status quo and I'm, I'm i'm like how do i portray that in, into work you know and like my like you, you you guys i i i do everything i like i i don't like to call myself just a visual artist or photographer like i i don't clash with just straight photographers whatsoever you know I, oh i don't really fit in with straight photographers i'm an artist you know i love you know, I, I paint, you know, I have a lot of oils back there. I experiment with visuals, cut up technique, like you said. I, I uh, you know, basically I have a manuscript of, of stream of conscious thoughts. I type every day on a typewriter in the morning. Then I cut it up and paste it on like say oil and, and wood and, and found material, you know, and see what comes of it, you know, um, like with visual associations and stuff like that. So I, I totally, I'm, I'm like on that same plane of like, I get it. Like, I, I totally just, I'm like, now I'm trying to figure out how do I travel like that, you know, because I, I feel like I've been kind of stuck in like, I need it, but now it's like the new variant. I'm like, oh, it kind of held me back from trying to go out and meet new people, you know, but um, now I guess then on that note, it's like how has all your insights and experimentations uh, really influenced what you've uh how you've evolved into your current work i guess so like say how has everything culminated into say for example the silver silver uh thresholds i guess well i mean the thing is that <laughs> one thing that i thought was really really interesting that i learned through all of these um journeys was to see what's going on with our world, with our planet, you know? Mm. And so obviously if we're traveling that much, we see all the environmental problems, we see all the social problems, we see how different countries take care of their people, how, how different problems affect different people, how everybody's kind of split in the moment, like everywhere, you know, there's, the, there's that group, that, that side and that side. And, um, I was very attracted to all the things like it's it can be really depressing 
you know, it can be super, super depressing. And I was kind of at one point, I just started looking out for things that were alternatives and that were like possibilities of changing something. So for me, um, it was really interesting to see all the projects that were working on sustainability and stuff like, you know, we were in Detroit, we saw all the gardens that people were making there and building and like, it was amazing the things they were telling us or um, we were in Hobart, Tasmania, and there's this amazing festival that only does alternative music and art and stuff like that. And we mm. spoke to shamans there and shamans and um, so all those kind of things. I thought that was really, really interesting. Like you say, you come from a corporate lifestyle, you know, and when you're in a certain scene, you don't really see what's happening in the other scenes. Mm. And for me, it was really exciting to see that there is a lot of stuff that's good that's happening but it isn't it doesn't get spoken about as much as the bad things that are happening that's true yeah you know, so it's kind of like why is this being hidden and, and why are people kind of i don't know why you, you kind of have the feeling that the the industries are trying to kind of force us all into one certain kind of mindset that's all about you know um money and making money and um profit and so um, for me, and I think for Alex too, it's really important for us that we read and we learn as much as possible about what's happening otherwise. And that kind of flows into our music and out of our music. And so um, we kind of have the feeling as if we're living in kind of biblical times in a way. You know, I kind of like, I wasn't raised in any religious fashion, but I did, you know, read the Bible in school and stuff like that. I mean, everybody knows the stories and there's, like these stories that keep on keep on coming up were like, wow, this is like really a biblical time where there's all these stories that you can think of in the Bible that we're kind of going through, like pandemics and and all those crazy themes, you know. And so all of those thoughts culminate into our albums. And um, either they're, they're, you know, spoken word or they're lyrics that we sing. And they always have to do like, you know, we did an album in Austria, which was called Meneteke. And Meneteke means the writing on the wall. And it was kind of, you know, it was 2015, right? And it was kind of like, hey, people, can you see the writing on the wall? It's pretty, pretty out there, you, you know, it's burning. <laughs> So and the book of Daniel, actually. Yeah. From the book of Daniel. And we were we, we were doing a residency in Austria there in a church, an old church that hadn't been used as a church for a long time. And so we kind of like were doing experiments with echoes and stuff, like just playing instruments, like the, Alex played the banjo, because the banjo doesn't ever really have an echo. So playing that in a church had an echo. Sure. So we were experimenting with that. It was interesting what kind of effect it had on the music just to be recording without even thinking about anything religious, you know? And so then of course we started thinking about religious spaces, like how do they influence you? How do they make you think? Only by the echo. And so, so basically all of these travels kind of, um, you know, they enlarge this, this, this vision of, of how our world is doing. And we kind of collect thoughts that we kind of throw out at people in our albums to like maybe pinpoint them to something that's different from what is normally being said in the industry or the corporate life or even just the media and stuff like that. Mm. And it's basically obviously things that are important to us and that help us and that kind of make us go, wow, that's interesting. And then it either goes into the lyrics or it goes into the music. So mm. it's, you know, and when it goes into the music, it's like this energetic thing, like, you know, something that's really, like for instance, the first song on the Silver Threshold, um, the whole album is very much about nature and humans versus mm. humans. So the first song, you kind of hear this nature and it's kind of like, you know, in the summer day, you're in, in, in you know, you're out in the, in the, I don't know, not the forest, but some kind of field or something. And you hear the bees, and the birds waking up and it's all beautiful and nature is so amazing. And then you hear this really heavy, weird sound getting louder and louder. It sounds really destructive. And that for us is, is mankind, <clears throat> sorry. Mm. And that's kind of like the, it's called Overture. And it's basically a hint about what this album is all about. It's like, mm. here's nature and here's us. And, you know, there's something happening. <laughs> that's not very good. What can we do about it? <laughs> well, let me ask you, I, um, since I, I think 
you know, live shows of, when was the last time I, I guess you, you performed live, I guess, it, because I'm curious of how you transmit that energy, you know, that, that trend, uh, that energy through, you know, say digitally, I, I guess it's through recordings. Right. But I, I, it, you know, I, I, sorry if I, I'm, <laughs> I, I guess, yeah. Are, do you feel like you've, you're lacking that transference of energy, like performing live comparatively, just recording digitally and promote uh, yeah, like no. yeah, really? yeah, absolutely. what you will not you think live is less energetic than digital? No, 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 quite on the contrary, quite on the contrary. I, I think uh, um, what we really convey is that what we do is not based on production as much as it is based on the energy that we create between the two of us mm. and that um, you know we can we we have made audiences cry just by you know, <laughs> just, just by uh, by the energy that we produce and, wow. and that's that's some um, like you know, I'm quite quite proud of that <laughs> and, <laughs> um, not cry because we were mean but because we touched them <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, cool. me, you know, like good art makes me cry it either, it either makes me laugh or it makes me cry yeah. <laughs> everything, everything else is not really worth talking about i think and um yeah so um i think i think we're, we're we've gotten quite uh, good at conveying the sense that we also uh, are sincere and and we uh, uh, what we do is also about integrity and uh, and uh, it's we we invest all our energy and all our heart in what we're doing and it's just the two of that therefore we are fragile and therefore we are you know it's like an like an honorable thing in, uh, in a way. Um, and I think that that's one thing that music can do basically uh, do for, for anyone is it, it can give you the kind of support. It, it can support you in developing your own way or going through with your own way. Uh, music has that power to... Uh, enforce you to um, ensure your decisions or uh, you know every everything that inspire. happened and, and inspire inspire you to to do your thing uh, every everything that happened in my life is I associate that with certain music and that certain music gave me the power to you know make important uh, decisions and to uh, to transcend and i think that's that's something that that uh, i am grateful for 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 a lot of uh, artists and music that I, that i love and uh, i i just hope that we can do kind of the same thing for, for our audience and uh, basically when we're live we should have three more musicians yeah. because <laughs> each one of us plays four instruments and sometimes like this time around is also going to be with visuals again so we're basically carrying everything we possibly can carry when we're on tour because we usually take trains yeah also because of environmental things we're trying not to fly unless it's like further than a thousand kilometers or something mm. um so we're always like we can barely carry what we have to take along and people can see that we're like playing three instruments and that like alex does the drum you know the drums the percussions the good the bass, the electronics, I'm doing the violin, the hurdy-gurdy, the auto harp, the visuals, we're singing choirs, we're speaking, we're just like, you know, we should, we should have at least four musicians with us, <laughs> and a tour manager. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that kind of comes across too, that, you know, we're really working, we're not like, it's not like just super visually jumping on no, stage and going, no, bah! <laughs> there's no time for posing here, nope. man. You know? <laughs> no posing. <laughs> Yeah. Hard too, work. too many, too many tasks. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow! People are usually pretty impressed. <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> I'm not sure if I could do it. Or yeah, yeah. I would. I would be. Uh, yeah, it would be a struggle for myself. <laughs> so I don't play instruments. So that we cut the instruments out real quick. 
or maybe like a little maraca there or a hand drum, but that's it for me. You know? Or cowbell, you know. But uh, <laughs> um, wow, yeah. Did you have you have you guys had a chance to perform live this year? I mean, maybe even outdoors. Like I, I've been to a lot of outdoor stuff in the city, but I haven't really felt comfortable in the, the smaller venues or you know, but particularly yeah, in nice we, weather. But we actually managed to play three shows this year. Hmm. Um, the first one was um, at a festival slash conference of um, modular uh, synthesizers, um, <laughs> Eurorack synthesizers. It's, it's like a, you know, it's like a model train um, kind of uh, convention for people that, that build these little modules. And it's great because it's very anti-capitalist in a way that there's no... Uh, there's no competition between these guys, you know, they're just like nerds from all over the world and, and all of their modules, you know, like are compatible with each other. And they're all like, Ooh, hoo, hoo, let's go. And, um, and uh, our record company Mute curated a, a stage at this convention. So that was the, the first show we played. No, that was actually the second show that we played. The first show we played was in, that was in Berlin, hmm. uh, outdoors. Um, and the first one we played was supposed to be outdoors in Austria in Klagenfurt. That's in the uh, the delta between Austria, um, Italy, Italy, and, and Slovenia. Slovenia, Slovenia. Yeah. Right, and uh, that was for uh, like an art walk through the city, and we were supposed to play the same half an hour set three times in a backyard of a medieval building. In it's Frankfurt. an amazing town. It's yeah. a little town yeah. called Klagenfurt and it's really, really, really old. Yeah. And, they, and the most um, amazing thing about it is that they have like all these little courtyards everywhere mm -hmm. that are connected to other courtyards. So you can, it's like this maze and you can go through all these different courtyards with walls that are huge and like really, really old. And so what they do is this art walk in these different courtyards where you can just like walk through the whole town for hours. And in each courtyard, there's something else happening. Unfortunately, so, it rained all yeah, day. So we, <laughs> so, we played, so we played inside a gallery and there again, it was, you know, like masks and only a few people in the room. And, and so that was the first time. And the last time that we played this year, um, was we two weeks ago? Two weeks ago, we opened a film festival in Barcelona, Spain, where we did the live soundtrack to an experimental movie that Danielle has created. Oh wow, cool! So that those were the three shows in, in uh, 2021. Yeah. Am I correct? Yeah. 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 Well, actually, we did one cover version so song, but that was oh, like a concert. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. For the opening of Danielle's uh, exhibition that which we, we just, just took down, <laughs> that we just took down, um, we did uh, uh, an evening of playing our favorite like. Um, tunes like folk, country, all kinds of different tunes, basically stuff that you can sing in harmony vocals. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. we thought, you know, if we're not doing anything or if we're not touring or whatever, it's kind of sad because usually, you know, especially since we're nomads, we do music all the time. And now that we don't have any shows, basically we're either recording something or working on something, but we're not actually doing music. And um, so we thought it'd be nice to do something together every day just to be doing a little music together. And we said, okay, well then why don't we just, cause we're singing in harmony on, you know, on our albums. And we said, why don't we just sing some regular, our favorite songs and try to sing them all in harmony. And so we've been doing that since the summer, like every day for two hours, just singing, you know, um, Gillian Welsh, Beatles, L Leonard Cohen, like whatever, and just singing. And it was so much fun that we said, okay, we're just gonna, like when I opened my my exhibition, we were like, let's do a little show of that. And it was fun. I mean, you know, it's completely different to what we regular usually do, which just for the fun of it. But I mean, it's, you know, it's, I think that in times like this, it's really important to, um, continue doing what you really, really love because sure. it gives you energy. And so that kind of did that with us. Yeah, yeah. Well, where can, uh, oh, Danielle, where could one see your work, I guess, on online? Like, does the, the gallery have uh, 
any images online from your previous uh, show? Um, she's kind of, she's my homepage. Of, yeah, oh, yeah. Homepage that I yeah. that I update regularly, and uh, it's <laughs> www.daniellepichotto.com, and oh. they see all her art and all kinds of different things. Awesome. Yeah. How about you, Alex? Uh, are you strictly music? Do you have any visual stuff, or uh... he does uh, film music? I yes, I I I do commissioned works for for movies. So I I score oh. for for visual stuff, and I get to get to stare at the same sequences of movies over and over while I write for it. Um, I used to do a lot of drawing when I was younger. I kind of, uh, I don't know, I stopped doing that for some reason. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm basically all about sound. Know, I'm all about sound music. And I'm, I suppose I'm a I'm a bit of a, you know, I do sound design, so I'm I'm a bit uh, of a nerd, if you will, and I, bit. <laughs> you know, you're a nerd. Period. <laughs> he reads <laughs> manuals. Yeah. Before, yeah. Before, before falling asleep, that's a nerd. I'm sorry. <laughs> so you know, like I I do I do this kind of stuff, you know, like I I build. You love manuals. I, I, yeah, no, and I I like I like building. Uh, complex systems or you know and if it if it is only plugging different uh stomp boxes together and uh, making feedback loops and stuff so that's i suppose that's the kind of uh as visual as it gets for me you know it's like yeah. you're, you're put, really putting good. putting modules to, uh, together yeah you know? yeah um, yeah, but you're really like he's really picky when we do our covers, for instance. That's, oh, I did the I did the the drawings on uh, the silver threshold are by by me. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's right. Uh, he's he's it's interesting because he's a lot pickier than I am when it comes to details of like if you're doing a layout for something. Yeah, I'm a bit of a I'm a bit of a um, symmetry fascist. You know, like <laughs> I um, you know if if things are out of whack you know like in a in a visual design like like our record cover design i i get you know i get uneasy i get a very uneasy feeling and yeah but you've uh, got your very own kind of i have an aesthetic aesthetic yes. of um what perfection is <laughs> so it's like basic german design in general you <laughs> know the really <laughs> Yeah, well, if you, want to, them, you know? if you want to bring in the stereotype, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you have to know that Alex is, um, everything he does is very much Alex. And so mm. if he says, what, you're what fascist? <laughs> symmetry. Symmetry. <laughs> so <laughs> the symmetry that you think is symmetry, some other people would think is not symmetrical. So it's it's not that stereotype. I can assure both of you. <laughs> I can, you know, like, on the on the front cover of, of the the silver threshold, there's these two um, uh, was it the Fibonacci sequences? The we call it the Goldene Schnitt. What's yeah, that? What's I don't know. It's like that. It's a kind of like that, a that twirl. Spi that spiral. Yeah, right. the, the golden ratio or uh, yeah, exactly. golden ratio. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so you know, I placed those two golden ratio spirals on the cover, and I tell you, <clears throat> I labored over the positioning of those. It looks random, but I tell you, I it took me a day to uh, just place them right on on top of that picture. Yeah, I'm too impatient for that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess, uh, you know, what is it, about nine o'clock there already? Or, yep, sorry. 10 past yep. nine. Yeah, yeah. I I probably have so much more to discuss, and I would love, probably just love to just fly over and just meet you in person. <laughs> like, I, I need collaborators like yourselves. Like, I try, I have all these ideas similar, and it's just like, I've been so kind of in this little iceberg of uh, island of mine, but... Uh, I, we, have uh, a really, really, we have a really great friend in New York called Larry Seven. You should check him out. He does amazingly weird sound performances and the whole scene around him is fascinating. I did a documentary on him. Oh, cool. um, you said Gary? Larry. L-A-R-Y-7. Yeah. The number seven. Oh, yeah, he's amazing. Larry. 
cool. Yeah. yeah. You, you check him out. He's in your neighborhood. Where he yeah. lives, he's, he's one of, he's a uh, Lower East Side original. He still lives in that area oh. and, and he's a, a very special character and yeah. it's great. They do great stuff. So that whole scene is amazing. If you want it, like, you know, inspiration. He also does like photography. He was a super um, successful photographer that was taking pictures of all the really big artists, but with old cameras that still flash. Like he refuses to do anything yes. digital. He's the, yeah, he's yeah. The, he's the founder, the president, and the sole member of the Analog Society. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. That's amazing. Well, we might have a second member. <laughs> He's a really, really great guy. I talk to him like once a month at least. If cool. Not cool. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, to wrap up, uh, any uh, any projects planned or new pr stuff planned for 2022 or any hopes or uh, dreams, wishes for next year, because uh, we're on the verge of 2022 and it's, it's kind of parallel, parallel, it's looking similar to 2020, 2021, like, oh, so anything, uh, anything for the new year, I guess. Well, we, um, we have Danielle booked a tour for us starting on the, on the 22nd of February, 22, two, 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 two. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the first uh, show is supposed to be in Dresden, and then it's like 12 shows? 20. 20 wow. shows starting, <laughs> starting from So we're being very February. positive. So we're just going to say everything's going to be OK. Yeah. We'll yeah. yeah, fingers crossed, you know, like that we would love to play that tour. So that's going to work out. Yeah, and our, our American Booker is trying to get us over, too. But it really depends on what the situation is like. So we'll oh, yeah. see. Oh, yeah. But we're just trying to be, you know, it's so easy to get depressed at the moment. And we're trying to do everything we can to stay as positive as possible. Because I read this really great sentence not long ago. It's like, if you manage to stay positive yourself, you will pull other people with you. Mm. And the more people do that, the more people are going to become pulled with you. So it's kind of like a responsibility, not only towards yourself, but towards others. And that's what we're concentrating on. It's hard to do in the, the digital media world these days when everybody's just like, well, the news just projects doom and gloom, you know? So it's, uh, how do we project uh, collective positivity, you know, globally? But I guess we would have to start with our own community, right? Exactly. <laughs> and then spread that way. But yeah, yeah, it's hard when everybody, you know, we're so connected to that constant flow of media and which only, and in, in that's how, you know, these media channels survive is just project the negative, more negative side of uh, life, you know, and, and the events, but. Uh, I mean, I think we're doing the right thing right now. Yeah, I mean, we're, yeah. we're networking with you on the other side of the planet. And, yeah. you know, in the words of Comandante Che Guevara, don't complain, organize, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it, well, exactly, exactly. And that, you know, that's the whole spirit of my series and my conversations. It's, it's, me, my, my longing to connect with other artists and interesting individuals and, and discuss ideas and, and what they're creating and, and you know, and, and hopefully I can, you know, morph it into something else. Uh, so um, one, one other thing, any advice for younger artists in a late capitalistic age these days and how could they, is it possible to kind of live that uh, a truly artistic life these days without making money, you know, or working 50 hours a week for a corporate entity? Well, I think it's like, you have to make yourself independent and it's really hard doing that in the city. Hmm. Unless you have a really, really tight, tight knit group of friends. But in, in the cities, it's really difficult because of the rents. Yeah. yeah, I would. I would also say is is the uh, the capitalistic system forces this idea upon us that we can only survive if we compete, and we have to overcome this dogma. It really is also about solidarity and finding the right group of people, a right gang of friends that that makes things happen and supports each other. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's a very thing, the very important thing for somebody who's starting out like 
don't try to, you know, don't try to be the alpha, don't try to uh, compete with everyone, you know, you know, make sure that you get along with each other and that, that you uh, develop a sense of solidarity and help each other out and, you know, yeah, and, that's really and do things together. I think that's the most important. Yeah. yeah. And also, you know, another thing I think is really important is the industry is always telling us what we need. And um, that's one of the reasons why we were like, when, when we became nomads, we were like, you know, everybody says you need a house. You need, but, and we're like, but the house is that, or the apartment is that which is swallowing all of our money. Yeah. So we had the choice of either getting a job to pay for it, ex, like a day job, or we just give up that thing that's swallowing money. Mm. And so it's like, there's alternatives to how to live like at the moment for instance we don't have an apartment we only have a, a tiny room where we sleep and we have two studios and that's all we need really because if we want to invite people and in, you know if you're allowed to without the pandemic we can invite them to our studios right. and otherwise we have a bedroom where we can we have a tiny little kitchen so you know people would say well you know in your age you need an apartment and you need that kind of status and you need those symbols and all that but in reality when we gave up everything to became, become nomads, we realized that everything we gave up, we didn't miss. All the stuff that we had gotten before, we didn't miss. We had two suitcases per person and we were perfectly happy. So it's kind of like, they're telling us that we need stuff that we don't need. And so what do we really need? Like, I mean, you know, it's not a universal thing. Everybody needs something else, mm. but um, that can make you more independent. Mm. Mm. Yeah, because you have to realize it's a conscious it's a conscious decision. Every materialistic thing that you gain, you are responsible for. So you have to make that conscious decision. Am I ready to take responsibility for this piece of equipment that I just purchased? You know, because it has to be maintained. And uh, do I really need it? Um, and if I do really need it, do I have the time to? Uh, work with it properly the, the way that it that it's worth the investment and and all these thoughts what, what was it um love love will uh, no money will buy it will buy you a fine dog but only love will make it wag its tail mm. <laughs> <laughs> i like i like that <laughs> And that's a perfect line to let you guys go and, and <laughs> close well, on a strong time. note. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, well, have a great evening uh, in Likewise, Berlin. Morning. <laughs> oh, no, morning. It's um, afternoon, 3.20 here, uh, p.m. Oh, okay. Eastern Standard Time. So yeah. I will... Probably take a nap. No. <laughs> <laughs> I like to paint at night. So I'm more like my visual side comes out at night. Oh, wow. Then you'll really like Larry because he only gets up at seven five in the evening. Yeah. Yeah. Five in the afternoon yeah. and he goes to bed at seven in the morning. Oh, nice. Yeah. No, I, I'll definitely link up with him at four. Yeah. yeah four a.m. Like, hey. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's go shoot with uh, just these analog cameras. You know, <laughs> let's do it. Right. <laughs> But, uh, oh, thank you so much for your conversation and your time. I look forward to diving deeper into your visual work, Danielle, and uh, your thank musical you. stuff, both of you. And uh, you. hopefully I, I, I have on my goals of 2022, prior to talking to you, you both, uh, go to Berlin. So hopefully I'll go to Berlin <laughs> somehow, but. Look us, look us up, you have to contact. <laughs> yeah, just like. Yeah. Uh, just please send us please send us a link to the to the show once once it's edited yeah of course so of course I, I release this every two weeks and uh via i i partnered with um toronto-based v13 media it, um they're more music and culture blog in, in toronto and um so every two weeks i, I um release it and almost up to five hundred thousand views so far so that's nice cool. yeah. that's yeah. fantastic yeah yeah just being myself you know so it's cool and, and very okay cool. but um, you use, but you're like recording only our voices that are like it's not visual right oh it's visual yeah I, oh, really? I, oh yeah it is yeah i i just toss it up on youtube really and i don't edit i just oh i'll just toss down the saturation to black and white and that's it um, okay and that's it no editing no no yeah. no production just as <laughs> is i could okay. i could stumble i could you know 
once again, this is my statement, though. It's uh, I'm tr just trying to be honest and have honest conversations in a world of over overproduced uh, everybody trying to be an Instagram influencer, etc. I'm kind of going against that grain because I, I respect art too much to just try to be, you know, um, just airbrushed, you know, I to be lack of better term right now, but. All right. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. Great. Thank you so much. Take care now. Happy Take New care. Year. Oh, happy New, happy New, New Year. Year as well. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye.